this story is so amazing that I had to make a separate video of it. It's about a lost woman named Polly, and it has a happy ending, fortunately. This is in Florida after the Second Seminole War. The Great Florida War ended in 1843 before the uh, final conflict, the Third Seminole War. But it's about a Ethan Allen Hitchcock. And this guy right here, he was uh, a most says it's the most extraordinary story in his own words. An Indian woman named Polly, who spoke no English, lost her way and ended up in Florida. And hopefully it has, uh, fortunately, it has a happy ending. Ethan Allen Hitchcock, he's well known. Here's a picture from the Library of Congress. Well known for his uh, career during the Civil War and the Western Frontier. Also service under uh, General Gaines in Florida in 1836. He wrote the early reports that uh, Gaines had. He sent out the press re release about the news about Major Dade and his defeat and Major Dade being killed. That ended up uh, in the newspapers. The first account I saw was in a newspaper in Mobile, Alabama, about uh, two weeks after it happened. Uh, or, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, yeah, we we think he's the one notified in uh, Mobile. I think he was at Fort Brooke at the time. But uh, even Alan Hitchcock, he worked under the uh, Department of Indian Affairs to negotiate with the several scattered ban bands still remaining in Florida after the Second Seminole War had ended. And this was while he was uh, stationed at Fort Stansbury near the Wakola Springs in Florida. And I found this information on microfilm, the Indian Affairs papers. And then further information, the story in Hitchcock's uh, biography, Chapter 25 of 50 Years in Camp and Field, Diary of Major General Ethan Allen Hitchcock, written in 18 or 1909. Uh, this biography can be found on Google Books, but Hitchcock's story in the book seems a little embellished in the letters he writes from what was found in the Indian Affairs papers. So I'm going to actually read what's in the Indian Affairs papers. Hitchcock received word that an Indian woman of an Indian woman from uh, General Richard Keith Call. Call was governor again. This was his second term. A woman named Polly, as she became known, was found by local settlers on the Ochizi settlement along the Apalachicola River. It's on the northern part of the river across from uh, what is today Torreya State Park and the Gregory Mansion. Polly spoke no English. And so the settlers did what they usually do uh, when somebody who's Indian and doesn't speak the language to make her talk and get information from her, they put a noose around her neck and threaten to hang her. She starts to cry incessantly and wouldn't stop. Fortunately, uh, Colonel Hitchcock sent an officer to retrieve her and take her away from these horrible people. And let's have Hitchcock's letters tell the story. This is a letter from Hitchcock to Department of Indian Affairs. Fort Stansbury, March 4th, 1843. Dear sir, with my most personal regards to yourself, I send the command an official note, which refers to indeed to but one single poor woman, uh, but it is with a most extraordinary case in the history of Indian immigration. The woman was very near being put to death by the people near Ochizi, either because she is an Indian woman or because she couldn't, poor thing, speak a language any of them could understand. This woman ought not to be such among the Seminoles or Creek. She is assuredly a Potawatomi woman, however strange it may appear. And this continued on additional page. This uh, Ethan Alan Hitchcock's letter to Indian uh, Secretary of Indian Affairs. T. Hartley Crawford. He says, as strange as may seem, I am convinced she is of the Potawatomi tribe and may have attempted to make her way back 
from Mary Stee Signes to the old Potawatomi country in Indiana, but how she contrived to reach Apalachicola River is a mystery I cannot solve. The Potawatomis, if I mistake not, speak a mixed language. They have mingled a good deal with the Ottawas, Minamanis, Chippewa, and it may be possible that some of these words I send you have some similitude to words of these languages. I shall report the case to General Worth on his return from New Orleans, where he has gone on a visit, but in the meantime, I would respectfully call your attention to a case as possibly you may think it proper to provide means for sending the woman to the care of the superintendent of Indian Affairs at St. Louis, where her proper home can be doubtless ascertained through some no Northwestern interpreter. You may rest perfectly sure that she is not a Creek or Seminole, nor does she belong to any Southern tribe. She might be sent to the Army Quartermaster in New Orleans, who could put her on a boat and some steamboat for St. Louis at very little expense, but it may require the order of the Secretary of War. Respectfully, Ethan Allen Hitchcock, Lieutenant Colonel, 3rd Infantry to Honorable T. Hartley Crawford, uh, Commandant of Indian Affairs in Washington City. And here's a letter from Ethan Allen Hitchcock to the Secretary of War. From Fort Stansbury, March 4th. Sir, I have an extraordinary case, the circumstances of which I make it proper to communicate with the Chief of Indian Bureau in relation to it. A few days ago, I received a virtual intimation from His Excellency Governor Call that an Indian woman had been taken prisoner near Ochizi on the Apalachicola River, and the governor advised my sending for her which I did immediately and is now at my post. By the message from the governor, I was informed that the woman had given no account of herself, but that she had several papers purporting to recommendations to the kindness of the people of the country. I sent a very intelligent young officer, Lieutenant Baker, to take possession of the woman, but he was unable to obtain any clue to her history uh, failing with good interpreters to induce her to give any account of herself. He reported that the people in the country had not succeeded in making her talk to induce which they made preparations for hanging her, placing a rope around her neck, which only threw her into a flood of tears. They stated that she had been almost constantly in tears ever since she had been taken prisoner. Uh, not probably not even knowing that she's in Florida at this point. One of her papers purported to have been written in Jefferson City, Missouri, but without a date. It is signed by A. Wilcox. The people of Cheesy thought this paper was written in Jefferson County at Monticello, reading County for City and M.O. for Monticello, and appeared to have no dream of her having wandered from one of the Northwestern tribes. This paper represents the woman as a Choctaw, anxious to go to the Choctaw Nation, but immediately below this statement, a man signing his name, William N. Hancock, certifies that he, I speak the Choctaw language, and she cannot understand me. Another of her papers is dated November 6, 1842, at Yazoo Valley, Mississippi, and signed by uh, Mr. William H. Danny, and is written in the kindest spirit, recommending the woman under the name of Polly to the goodwill of everybody. Says she is called Polly in the first name papers. Another of the papers begins with poor lost Indian Polly in large letters dated January 27th, 1843. So we're like six weeks after that, but not signed and no place is named. Another paper represents that the woman is said to be seminal, and that is dated January 9th, 1843. No place named is signed James Taylor or Tabor. Uh, hard to read, but the papers are badly written except the first, but evidently by different persons, except two of which I described as one, the first one, both of them being written on yellow paper, evidently by the same person. 
Yesterday, I had an interpreter of the Creek and Seminole languages present and made an effort to learn something of the history of the woman, but with very little success. The interpreter could not communicate with her at all before leaving me, was willing to certify that she was not Creek or Seminole. Supposing the papers dated in Missouri have been properly understood as written in Marcel Jefferson, County, Florida, I did not look very closely at the date until yesterday when the interpreter failed to make the woman talk with me. On examination, I saw that it was plainly written Jefferson City Mo, Mo for Missouri. And then rather thinking aloud than actually speaking, I began to tell over the names of some of the tribes north and west of Missouri as Shawnee, Delaware, and so forth, and finally named the Potawatomi tribe and saw her countenance indicate intelligence. Her eyes lit up. I asked if she was a Potawatomi, and she nodded assent, and her countenance brightened up very much. At length, I fell upon a plan of asking to, her to tell the names of certain familiar articles, a knife, a comb, bread, and etc., which I wrote down as nearly as I could as she pronounced them. These I shall send to you in order that if you have a vocabulary of the Potawatomi language, you may have them compared and it is possible her tribe may be traced. She is about 35 or 40 years of age, has an exceedingly sorrowful expression upon her countenance. She is not seminal, but who she is or when she came, unless from the Potawatomis is impossible to form an idea. But if from the Potawatomi tribe her reaching this country will be a mystery. And Hitchcock includes several words that he wrote down. And it's interesting to compare them to a modern list of words in the Potawatomi language. They're the same with slight differences accounted for, which happens over time, just as there are differences of some of the modern seminal words compared with some of the books written by Simmons or John Lee Williams 200 years ago. Copy of the papers is found with the Indian woman whose case is reported to Lieutenant Colonel Hitchcock per letter, March 4th, 1843. Fort Stansbury, March 4th, 1843. Copies of the papers in the hands of an Indian woman lately found near Ochesi on the Apalachicola River, supposed to be Potawatomi. The bearer of this very civil Choctaw woman named Polly, she is on her way to her people. Please be kind to her and point out a road and assist her on her way. She is honest. She has lived at my house sometimes. She speaks no English. English. Please feed her on her way. Signed, A. Wilcox. By way of the postscript, the people will oblige the bearer by supplying her wants. Jefferson City Mo. The above is written in bold, heavy, round hand on yellow paper, and another paper of the same kind and written uh, of the same hand in following. The old woman wants to go to the Choctaw tribe. We'll all be kind enough to point out the road to her and give her something to eat. My friends, let us have compassion on the Indians. God will record, reward us. In a fair hand below above is written, this old woman is not of the Choctaw tribe, for I speak Choctaw language and can't understand her. Signed, William M. Hancock. The above papers I consider as one. Second note, November 6, 1842, Yazoo Valley, Mississippi. It's written so badly written is very difficult to read. On the outside is written, Humanity to the Helpless, Black Creek, Mississippi. It says, as all men don't understand the language of an Indian, I take liberty of informing all men where this Indian Polly wants to go. She is on her way to the Choctaw Nation. She has good papers, but is afraid to show them as she tells me she has had them torn up and put on the wrong way. She will do ourselves a kindness to send her home. Said Polly can't speak English at all. I am with respect, signed William H. Danny. Third note. The third note says, 
the Indian woman is said to be a seminal woman, lost from her people. She is said to be an inoffensive woman. To all people seeing her direct her on the way west of the Mississippi as she wants to go back to her people. She is a poor human being. We ought to have compassion on her. To all people that see her, give her something to eat and let her go. For she seems to be in trouble. She sees several persons to show that she is lost. Do her all good you can, for good will reward you. I do not know where she wants to go, only what I learned from her papers. This is January 1843. The woman's name is Polly. Signed, I am Taylor or Tabor. Hard to read. And this fourth letter is labeled, it says, this paper it is endorsed Polly's recommendation. It says, poor lost Polly, look at her papers. She is a good recommendation to be honest and inoffensive and wants to go to the Mississippi. Give the poor thing something to eat and God will reward you. January 29th, 1843. No place named on the paper uh, from uh, include in the letters with Ethan Allen Hitchcock. Okay, uh, this is a letter from the Secretary of Indian Affairs, T. Hartley Crawford, to Secretary of War, James N. Porter, uh, going to the War Department, Office of Indian Affairs, March 23rd, 1823. So this is two months after the last letter. So she went uh, from maybe Indiana down to Missouri, sent from there down to Mississippi, and now she's in Florida. And it says a letter has been received at this office from Lieutenant Colonel Hitchcock communicating the information that a poor Indian woman has been found in Florida, supposed to be Potawatomi, and to have lost her way by some extraordinary combination of circumstances. It would seem to be proper that some measure should be taken to ascertain the tribe to which she belongs and to have her conveyed to her friends. And with the view, I would respectfully suggest that this office be authorized to address a letter to General Worth, commanding the in Florida, and also one to Lee Grand Capers, a squire, the diversing agent of the Seminoles, removal, that the necessary orders may be given for defraying her expenses that may be incurred in her account. She might be sent to New Orleans to the case of the quartermaster to be by him put on board a steamboat to convey her to St. Louis where she'll find the superintendent in possession of instructions from this office for her further disposition. Your most obedient servant, T. Hartley Crawford to the Honorable J.M. Porter, Secretary of War. A general, a letter from General Worth to Crawford from St. Augustine, dated April 13th, 1843. April 13th, 1843 says that General Worth has instructed Hitchcock to take the woman with him when his regiment departed for Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, and thence to obtain some means for her to be sent from there, there to her people. The handwriting was difficult to read, but I was able to get most of it from the letter. This is a letter in the Indian Affairs. So Ethan Allen Hitchcock, he's with the 3rd Artillery, and his regiment is going up to Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis and said, go ahead and take her with you and see if you can get a ride to where she needs to go. Hitchcock concluded the story in 50 years in camp and field. And it has a happy ending. On reaching our destination near St. Louis, I explained the strange case to Mr. Pierre Chateau, a famous Indian fur trader and son of the founder of St. Louis. And uh, if I may note here is that uh, Chateau family also uh, was instrumental in starting the area in Indian territory, had trading post, and I believe were instrumental in starting Fort Gibson 200 years ago. And Mr. Chateau agreed to send her in one of his trading boats a thousand miles up the Missouri 
to where the Potawatomi tribe had settled years before. He promised to bring her back if the guess was wrong. It proved to be right, fortunately. On the return of the expedition a few months later, I was rejoiced to hear that the poor wanderer had rejoined her friends and that, in fact, she was a sister of Wabunsa, one of the chief of the tribe. The story brought back was that while a party of Potawatomis were immigrating westward through Missouri, this woman missed one morning on the march of several miles. Two young men were sent back for her, but she had wandered off the road and was given up as lost. After leaving the trail, she must have wandered in the je direction of Jefferson City, where she met a humane Mr. Wilcox, on whose recommendation some kind river captain, supposing her to belong to the Choctaw tribe, have given her passage down the river to Yazoo as the nearest point to what had been the Choctaw country. From there, she must have strayed, the Lord knows how, several hundred miles east and south, until she was captured in the Florida wilderness and threatened with instant death belonging to a dangerous band of marauding Indians on the Apalachicola. So maybe they thought she was with Pacos, uh, uh, Pascofa's uh, group. I have often greatly thought that if I had not happened to know a few Chippewa words, she might have wandered on and on a harmless derelict till she died of grief and starvation or became victim of some party of enraged and ignorant settlers. So she found her way back to her people and the story had a, uh, you know, a ha happy ending for her fate that she was able to rejoin her people. So uh, that's an interesting story. It was well worth the video all its own. I hope you enjoyed it. And that's the actual letters from the Indian Affairs Papers. Okay, see you next.